Now, Gothic homes will be widely varied and look nothing like this, but it's kind of an art history joke because that's American Gothic and that's the house from American Gothic. Okay, I'll, I'll move on. There's a wide range in difference between what we see in Gothic homes. We will see very, very simple homes, as you see at the top, with thatched roofs and animals and people in the same space. We will see far more complex homes, all based on social class. A merchant, for example, might have a better home than, say, a serf still working under the feudal system. So, your typical surf home, and actually this would be probably uh, upper working class, lower middle class home based on the number of rooms. But you would have sleeping quarters. Oftentimes those sleeping quarters, if they're separate, will be upstairs. The reason is heat rises. And again, that idea of trying to keep warm at night. Here we have what appears to be a dining area. For many homes, they're going to actually have stables inside the home. The hearth will generally be at the center. There's oftentimes not a chimney. So the inside of the space, just like during the Romanesque and during the medieval, is going to be dark, smoky, sooty. It's not a pleasant place to be. It's warm and comfortable in the winter, but it's still not particularly, uh, well, what we would consider a nice place. And if there is a kitchen, there may be a kitchen with a separate fireplace. Now, oftentimes, if this is going to be, you know, your typical serf's home, we can get rid of the bedroom. All of them are sleeping in the same room, in the hearth room. We can get rid of the kitchen because they won't have one. They will have a stable, and typically the animals will actually have more space than the humans indoors. They're in the same space. But we're going to be looking at manor houses and we're going to be focusing on Northern Europe and England here because these houses take on a different form when you move to Italy. Italy being far more urban throughout the medieval period and based on trade rather than Northern Europe and England, which are based on the feudal system, which is agricultural. So the manor house is actually a misnomer. It's usually a group of buildings, usually in a square to allow for some element of defensibility. By this point, castles have gone by the wayside. There's no need for them. We have gunpowder cannons. They knock down walls, so what's the point? But you still want some defensibility against, say, the peasants who might rise up, or the pheasants that rise up. I don't know. Maybe you've ticked off the bird life. And usually there's going to be a large home and a great hall, and then there's a series of outbuildings for servants for various uh, uh, purposes. For example, you might have one that's a distillery, one that's a butchery, you might have animal stables, etc. The house itself is usually fairly simple and straightforward, but we'll get into that a little bit more as we move ahead. Let's start with the Great Hall. The Great Hall is where you have these massive parties. It's where you would have social gatherings. It's also, in many cases, where your guests would sleep. They would pull out those same woven mats that we saw in the Romanesque, and they would lay them out on the floor. Now, we would often see a balcony. This is going to be called the Minstrel's Gallery. And that's where your musicians would play during parties, during gatherings of various sorts. During the day, you would lay out a trestle board or these tables on trestles. So these are nothing more than boards laid out on what we would think of as sawhorses, but they're called trestles at the time. This allows for that hall to be cleared at any time so that you can have a dance, a party, or a lot of people sleeping. As we move ahead, if we look at sort of a typical layout, here's our great hall. And we would have a dais. So this is a raised section, and we would have the chair of estate sitting there so that the lord of the house can sit there and show his status. Along the sides, we would see what is known as a screen passage. 
Uh, so they would hang tapestries with a gap to the wall, not for insulation in this case, because it's usually a much larger gap, but for servants to move through the hall without being seen, moving to the dais, uh, to the kitchen, etc. Usually off the dais, there's going to be a reception room. This is for private meetings for the lord or lady. It's going to be a space that is entirely developed for developing the status of that person and showing off their status. Today, you might put your degrees and diplomas, your awards, uh, your hunting trophies, etc., all in the same space. The kitchen has a couple of different elements. There would be a kitchen uh, closed off to the rest of the house because there are smells and things that come out of the kitchen that you really don't want getting elsewhere. You would have the pantry for storing dry goods. Uh, this would be things like salt, grain, etc. And you would have the buttery. The buttery is what we would call the wine cellar today. This is where they keep their alcohol, usually in barrels. So you would have a barrel of rum, for example, or a barrel of wine uh, rather than individual bottles because that's not really something that we're seeing in the Gothic. It's available, but very, very rare. In terms of construction, we see everything. It depends on where you are and what materials they have. We see stone construction. We will see brick construction. We will see timber construction. And that timber construction can take the form of these half timber structures where you have timber exposed on the outside and then the inside is what's called daub, D-A-U-B, and wattle, W-A-T-T-L-E. And daub and wattle basically means that I put either thin uh, pieces of wood in this space or sometimes I put thatch or woven reed in here and then I apply plaster over the top. And typically you would add something to the plaster like straw to give it some strength. In terms of the construction, it's actually something that we would recognize for the most part today, except for the jetty, but we'll get to the jetty this part later on. Uh, so we have the floor joists, we have our typical rafters and gables. We even have the purling, which we saw in China, but of course we're seeing it in Europe as well. So very simple wooden construction, especially in Northern Europe where wood is very, very common. In Italy, where wood is going to be a much more difficult resource to find, you typically see stone or brick construction. We also see gable houses, and we see these typically in Denmark, in uh, Amsterdam, in far northern Europe. And these come about because, of course, that real estate on the main street or the main channel is very, very expensive. And these are generally owned by merchants. The merchant lives up above, and then they have their shop down below. In some cases, they even have hoists, which you see here, uh, but you see one here, uh, you see one here. Those hoists are to pull material up from the street and sometimes store it either in the top stories or at least help move it into the shop. Now, because these tend to have both residential and commercial purposes, there's usually going to be some form of separation. So, for example, the entrance to the residence is going to be a stairway in the back that you can't access from inside the shop because on occasion, they like the ability to rent out the shop to someone else if their shop falls apart, if things don't work out for them. We also see the use of the jetty, which is where a building is built and you have the building and then it juts out and comes up larger in the second story. And this can actually happen again in the third story. Sometimes they get so close that the jetties actually almost touch as we see here. This was done because of taxation. You were taxed on the amount of ground that you were using, but not on the airspace. So you could get an extra few square feet of living space simply by allowing the space in the upper stories to jut out. Now, 
this sort of mixed residential and commercial space is something we still see today. Go to State Street in Madison or really any downtown and you'll see apartments up above and shops below. But today the shop owner usually does not live above the shop. This sort of construction will also change because by the end of the Gothic and by the time we get into the 17th and 18th century, there will become fire codes where you actually have to separate the buildings by a couple of inches and it will not allow for common walls. This way fire cannot jump from building to building. What does that mean for you from an interior design perspective? It means we are developing closer and closer to individual homes, the single family home as we know it. At the time, that still doesn't really exist. And even those manor houses that uh, we have seen or that we will see are typically extended family. There's a lot of people living in them, but we are getting closer and closer to what we know as a house today.